I would like to start out by introducing the speakers of our first session this morning, which is what we've all been waiting for now. <laughs> the Protocol of Grace and Reconciliation Through Separation. And our speakers today are the Reverend Keith Boyette, the president of the Wesleyan Covenant Association, the Reverend Junius Dotson, General Secretary and CEO of Discipleship Ministries, and Jan Lawrence, Executive Director of Reconciling Ministries Network. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my joy to be the first speaker right after lunch. <laughs> the Lord declares through the prophet Isaiah, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. It is my joy and privilege to talk to you about the protocol of reconciliation and grace through separation. Friends, we have been in a wilderness since the 2019 special call general conference. It did not resolve our differences. In fact, it intensified our conflict. And recognizing this reality, Bishop Yamasu invited several of us across the theological spectrum into a conversation in July of this past year. The goal of the conversation was to find consensus on a future that would not do further harm to the whole church. Now I have to say to you that we agreed on almost nothing in our first meeting. But we did agree that we were at an impasse. We agreed that this impasse was paralyzing mission and ministry across our connection. We agreed that it threatened forward movement toward vitality and a sustained effort of intentionally reaching new people for Jesus. We agreed that the witness and mission of our church hung in the balance. We agreed that separation was inevitable. The uniqueness of this conversation was that it was broad, it, it was diverse, it was initiated by Central Conference leaders, and of course this conversation morphed uh, into a conversation that was mediated by the world-renowned Ken Feinberg. Ken Feinberg's presence spoke to the urgent historical significance of our time together. Feinberg, who brokered the 9-11 Victims' Compensation Funds, the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster settlements, two of the worst disasters of the past 50 years. In any mediation, one of the foundational understandings is that no one side gets everything they want. The goal in our talks was not to create winners and losers. The goal was to get to yes. So then all sides must be willing to give and take in order to get to yes, even in the midst of deep disagreements. So this protocol is a result of an amazing collaboration between people who didn't agree on a whole lot of things, but share a deep love for the church and its mission. And so I stand before you this, today to say uh, I'm hopeful. I feel hope for the first time in a long time because I believe the protocol finally gives us a path, a path to turn our focus away from more legislation and more legislation and more legislation and possible litigation back to liturgy. Yes, God is doing a new thing. The protocol creates a clear and hoped field process. It does not predetermine the outcomes. We're unaware of the outcomes, but it does give us a clear process that enables the United Methodist Church to continue while honoring and respecting those who believe based on their strong convictions that they must separate in order to live out those convictions with integrity. The protocol charts a new path forward 
while accommodating new denominational expressions. And it provides a path that moves the post-separation UMC beyond hurtful and exclusionary language. This agreement allows us to not cause further harm to our church and the people that God has called us to reach. It outlines clear steps that help us to achieve respectful and dignified separation without dissolving our denomination. Pat and Keith, I'm sorry, Jan and Keith are gonna come and give you further details. Keith followed by Jan. Thank you, Junius. This was an amazing experience and in the course of our time together, we found that where we had no trust, we were able to build trust across great divides. We spent nine total days in the course of negotiation and for eight and a half days, there was no agreement amongst our, our group. But we were able to reach an agreement because of our commitment, as Junius said, the deep love that we have for the church and its mission. My respect for those that were at the table with me is tremendous. Where we were unable, perhaps previously, to have conversations, new bridges for conversation have been established. My purpose in this time is to address for you the timeline and the voting thresholds in the, um, in the protocol. As you're probably aware, the protocol provides that upon adjournment of the 2020 General Conference, new Methodist denominations may indicate that they're coming into formation, and then a process will begin where central conferences, annual conferences inside and outside the United States, and local churches can make decisions about how they want to go align going forward. Our goal is to bless send and multiply for the sake of the greater mission of Jesus Christ. So the first uh, level of decisions re resolves around central conferences. Central conferences will ha have the right to make a decision about whether they desire to separate from the United Methodist Church and join or form a new Methodist denomination through December the 31st of 2021. They are to make their decision based upon a two-thirds vote. Every one of the voting thresholds were the result of significant negotiation and compromise. I say that this agreement, this plan, is set on a razor's edge because all of the different terms were carefully dependent upon other aspects of the decision. The central conferences, once they make their decision, annual conferences, both inside and outside the United States, will have an opportunity to make their choices. The annual conferences inside the United States can begin making decisions immediately after the adjournment of General Conference 2020, but will have until July the 1st of 2021. Annual conferences outside the United States will have a longer period because central conferences meet a little bit later in the calendar year that follows general conference. They'll have until July the 1st of 2022. The vote at annual conferences, both inside and outside the United States, in order for an annual conference to decide whether they're going to separate from the United Methodist Church and either join or form a new Methodist denomination is 57%. This was the last term of the protocol that was agreed to by the parties. And you can see by its very nature that it is a compromise that the parties to the mediation made. Those who would have preferred a two-thirds majority were dug in at that number. Those who preferred a 50% majority were dug in at that number. 
the mediator exercised his persuasive powers to persuade the protocol negotiators that a deal was better than no deal and that this was a way to compromise. Finally, local churches will have the opportunity to make a decision as to whether they will stay with their annual conferences decision or make a different decision from their annual conference. Local churches in the United States don't have to wait for uh, a decision to be made by their annual conference. Again, the, term, the thresholds in this area are likewise the result of compromise. The parties agreed that uh, a local church's primary leadership body, the ad council, the ad board, the leadership board, will make a decision on what the voting threshold will be. That threshold can be either a simple majority, 50% plus one, or a two-thirds vote of that local church. The decision will be made in a church conference at which every professing member of the church will have an ability to be present and vote. And whatever the threshold is that the uh, local church's leadership body has chosen will be the threshold that will exist for that church to decide whether they make a different decision than their annual conference makes, whether they're going to separate from the United Methodist Church to join or, for, or, or form a new Methodist denomination. Local churches have until December the 31st of 2025, 2024 to make that decision. The goal here is to provide a process that will enable churches to make the decision in a time frame that doesn't last forever, but takes care of their various needs. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. First, I want to say greetings from Reconciling Ministries Network. I'm Jan Lawrence, I'm the executive director. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I want to say a special word of welcome to those who are here who are my lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer siblings. These spaces can be difficult places to be in, and I appreciate your being here. I'm going to talk about two parts of our agreement. The first part I'm gonna talk about is our financial agreement. The second part I will talk about is the moratoriums. So as I look at the financial agreement, I think there's some, some things that people need to understand. First, this was a long discussion. We spent a significant amount of time at more than one of the, the times we gathered talking about what a financial separation might look like. When we met with the mediator, Ken Feinberg, the first time, he gave us a framework for our, for our mediation. One of the three pieces of that framework was a financial agreement. We went through a process where we met as small groups that were diverse groups and talked about what we thought the issues were and, and what we thought we, what our job might be with respect to recommending a financial agreement. Then on our last meeting, we brought in some financial experts from different parts of the church and we met with them and understood um, the reports that were available to us and were able to ask questions. There's basically four parts, four major parts. There are a lot of details and, and there are, I know because I've talked to many of you in the last day, there are a lot of questions about not only the financial piece of this, but other pieces of the protocol. We all need the time to, to ask those questions and answer those questions. I'm gonna hit the highlights. What we did is a, a few things. One is we agreed that the boards and agencies would remain in, intact. 
there was a lot of discussion about the future of the boards and agencies during some of the earlier meetings, and we agreed that they should remain intact and able to perform the ministries that they perform for the church. The four major pieces, though, beyond that were, first, finding a way to protect those parts of the church that had been impacted by the sins of racism because we all knew that during budget cutting times that was typically one of the first places that we look. So we wanted to protect that so that no matter what, going forward, there would be funds similar to what are, is there now for those ministries. So we allocated, or we set aside, $39 million over the course of eight years for that work. It includes the work that I just mentioned. It also includes funds for Africa University. The second piece of the financial terms we talked about is 27 million allocated for new denominations that might form pursuant to the protocol. 25 million of that was identified over four years for a traditionalist denomination. We knew there was one that already had a legal structure and a significant number of followers. So that was the first thing we did, was we, we addressed that piece. We didn't know, those of us at the table did not have information about other groups who had gone through legal steps. We knew there were other groups in the church that were talking about forming new denominations. But we didn't know of any other group that had gone through the process of setting up a legal structure. So we established $2 million in seed money that, if it's not used, would go back into the general budget. And it's, uh, like I said, I have a lot to cover and, and not really a lot, long time to talk about it. Um, the protocol does two other major things in terms of finance, financial set agreement. One is it, in, in effect, release, relaxes a trust clause as churches and annual conferences transfer from the United Methodist Church into a denomination that's pursuant to the protocol. Churches can, and annual conferences take their property with them, their liabilities follow them. And the fourth piece is that unfunded pension liabilities would also follow. The second piece of, my, of what I was asked to talk about this morning is the moratorium. There are two items or two places where we have called for a moratorium. The moratorium we're asking for started January the 1st. One of those places is a moratorium on the processing of complaints and on any charges that are in process against LGBTQ people or their ministers for violations of the part of the discipline that restrict that. The second place where we ask for a moratorium, well, let me, before I finish that, I want to say thank you to the, to the bishops who have agreed to support that part of the moratorium. There's nothing binding on anything other than the 16 people that were at the table. But in the spirit of the protocol, this is an important move for you to make. For those of you who have, feel like that, that you need to uphold the discipline and, and not honor this moratorium, I would just ask that you reconsider that. I ask that on behalf of the whole mediation team. 
It's something, the, it's something that we decided as we were moving forward that if we were going to move forward, we had to stop those places where harm was, or at least reduce the harm that was, was occurring today. The second place where there's a moratorium is on churches closing. And the simple reason for that is we didn't want to see a church closed before it had an opportunity to align with one of the new denominations or decide to remain in the United Methodist Church. And I am having a flag waved at me, so my time is up. Thank you.